The five lectures we're going to do are going to cover a lot of material and I'm going to try and spend the first lecture really talking about the state of the art um, up to about five years ago. So try and summarise about 20 years worth of compilation in a very fast way. And I'm going to try and talk, give you the motivation about why we need to rethink what we do inside the compiler. Uh, this will be some of it's really strongly opinionated, it's my view of things. Hopefully you'll get some feel of it. I'm going to try and start off relatively easy. So this first lecture looks at really some of the recent developments in machine learning and auto-tuning and search-based compilation. And then we're going to go to steadily more complicated lectures. So Wednesday's lecture is going to probably be the most challenging one, followed by Friday. So today should be easy. Tuesday, Thursday, not too bad. Wednesday and Friday, make sure you don't drink too much alcohol the night before. That's a warning to me rather than to you. OK, let's get going. So I'm just really going to be summarizing what, what I think are the important technologies we need for automation. The driving force for rethinking compilers is that the world has changed and we need to be able to do things ever more agilely and quickly, and that means automation. In fact, compilers are automatic tools. They automatically write programs for, me, for you. You may think you write a program and you write your C in Python, but a program is really x86 or assembler, and the compiler is doing that for you. However, over the years, we've tried to do this in a more abstract way, more automatic. So the need a compiler is part of a family of tools that automate. I'm going to try and say why the changing horizons and uh, landscape we see ahead of us require um, ever more automation. And part of that journey to automation has been the use of tools such as auto-tuning or search-based tools and machine learning-based tools. So that's really what today's lecture should be about. So most of the material you, should be able to, um, uh, you will be f mostly familiar with. Then I'm going to go on to what I think some of the technologies that we're going to need in the next five years. And I'm going to first going to talk about a really, um, a really compiler-oriented one, which is called rewrite rules. Rewrite rules are ways to formalize um, a transformation space or a program optimization space. And look at some of the work done in e-graphs and equality saturation. So this is a technology which I think will be ever more important as it allows us to automate the design of optimizers. Then on uh, Wednesday, it's the hard day, um, we took a look at something called programming embeddings in graph neural networks. So these are ways of taking programs and embedding them in a, should we say, a vector space. Have any of you ever seen the matrix where it's all the zeros and ones falling down? That's reality, right? That's exactly how it is. We take all the programs, stick them into zeros and ones, they're going to trickle down our screen, and voila, the machine works something out. Of course, there's some technical details behind that, and we're going to go into that in that lecture. The next lecture goes to a slightly different approach. It takes um, work from uh, the program synthesis community, which have been working in parallel to us for many years. And now I think it's the time that's ripe to know um, something about them. What they do is they actually, actually generate programs from specifications, but in an entirely different way to a compiler writer does. So they are a program generating community that are very distinct to ours. And actually, fact, I think the time is for us to come together. And there's some recent work in that area. Then I'm going to go to my favourite topic towards the end, which is basically using neural machine transformers. I think everybody's heard about ChatGPT. Is it going to steal your jobs? The answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, if you don't change. No, if you're clever. And we're going to talk about how transformers can do cool things in the final lecture and how large language models can influence programming. I might slip in some extra slides at the end. On that very last one, we've just had a piece of work we think is about to get published. I might want to give a sneak preview to you about that. Anyway, that's the overview of the structure of the day. I said the lectures are going to uh, be connected in an interesting manner. So the size of the circle of these lectures demonstrates how hard it's going to be. Today's easy. Wednesday and Friday can be hard. Medium days, uh, Tuesday and Thursday. So if you find today a bit too simple, don't worry, it's going to get harder. If you find today very hard, I apologise. I'll do my best to make it better next time. OK, so how are they connected? Well, today we're going to be looking at optimization technologies, and we're going to be looking again at that end on uh, tomorrow, lecture two. But um, part of the um, structure we use in machine learning technology requires features at the beginning of the process and the, uh, to, make, to drive the machine learning technology. And that idea of how to get features from programs is something that's been looked at for the last 20 years. I'm going to pick up with embeddings in lecture three, which tries to automate that process. So there's a connection with today and Wednesday. On Tuesday, we're also going to be looking at um, um, ways to search the space. And that shares some of the connections with Lecture 4, which tries to search a program space using program synthesis. And that has some connection with Lecture 3, which looks at neural models of programs to drive that search. So Lecture 3 and 4 connect that way. 
And then finally, when we get to uh, lecture five, when we look at transformers, we'll be looking at generative models. Generative models are different to normal machine learning models. They actually generate, say, a piece of text or a long string of things rather than a yes-no decision. And those generative models have some connections to some of the work we're looking in uh, lecture three. And they also have the ability to lift code from one language to another, which connects to lecture four. So hopefully this is the way that all the five lectures come together. I'm going to be covering an awful lot of material, um, lots of different papers and stuff in a sort of relative superficial manner, hopefully to give you a guide to the area and to maybe help you dig deeper rather than give you the depth of everything. So, uh, but if you have any questions, I'm available for tea, coffees, breaks, dinners, pasta. Yeah, we'll be there. <laughs> okay. So here's the key question. What is compilation? Yeah, I, I'm going to give you an answer which, which I disagree with, but I'm going to give you a traditional answer first. So it's this, really. It's, um, it's this big, thick book, which you must have made a fortune on. You stick your program into that book, you implement it by hand or by compiler, some tool, and out comes your source code, x86. That's what compilation is to most of us. So you stick some C into this thing, and out comes some assembler on the other side from GCC. That's what compilation is. I'm going to talk a little bit about that view of compilation as a like high-level source code to low-level assembler in the first part of this lecture. But to me, actually, I fundamentally disagree with that view. Compilation is really a part of a family of language translation tools. They take something and they take it to somewhere else. That A and B can be quite different things. They could be CX86, or they could be a specification written form or logic and a high-level language, or there could be some chat discussion you have with a, a device. There could be low-level code, there could be input-output behavior, and you could actually generate not assembler, but generalized parallelized code. So it's a translation process, of which this is the most traditional one. So that's how I see compilation. OK, so here's another way of looking at compilation. It's really a, a translation process from one level, level to another, one language to another. And the key thing about translations, particularly when it comes to programs, it's got to be correct. Okay? And I fact, this correctness thing really gets on my nerves because everybody all says, are you sure you're, oh, you've done the right thing? But it's really important from a compiler's point of view. If you're writing a program and, you're not, and there's bugs in it, you don't want to be worrying about whether the compiler's introduced bugs. Indeed, the number of times people blame the compiler and it's actually their own fault is very is huge. But if we ever give one mistake away, we've had it. So compiler writers are kind of obsessed with not um, producing errors. And that makes us naturally a cautious community. And being a cautious community means sometimes you don't get the best out of the hardware. We heard in yesterday's um, keynote, actually, in fact, we're only getting 5 to 10% of the performance of this hardware. Or maybe we're a part of that problem. We make sure we only generate code that's guaranteed to be correct. And we tend to put lots of um, safety checks in there and try to be very conservative because we're really worried about correctness. I'm not saying correctness is a bad thing, but it makes us shift, makes our mindset sometimes a little bit conservative. So really, what do compiler writers like myself and others work worrying about? Well, they worry about correctness first, but most of the effort in getting correct or translation type code has been done before. But I'll change my view on that towards the end of this series. But most of us have been worrying about f making things go better. What do I mean by better? They mean go faster, your code executes quicker. They're smaller, if you're an embedded device, you want to make sure your code footprint is as small as possible. Or you're cooler, you want to use less power, less thermal. So you have to, you've got an optimization problem. And most compiler research in the last sort of 20, 30 years has really largely been focused on this optimization stuff. Also, we hide the complexity. Actually, machines are not von Neumann machines. Actually, in fact, they've never been von Neumann sh machines. You've always had pipelining going on. So what happens is the um, hardware has, has um, predictive hardware underneath it. There's, of course, some microarchitectural uh, machine learning uh, branch predictions later on. That's what's going on underneath the hood. You've got cache misses. You've got hierarchies. You've got TLB misses. You've got interrupts. You've got crashes. You've got segmentation faults. All that stuff going on underneath the hood. But you as a programmer don't see that. And we as the compiler writer help hide some of that information. But the things we spend most of our time worrying about are basically parallelism and memory management. <clears throat> parallelism, try to use the available parallelism inside the hardware. That could either be multi-cores, multi-threads, pipeline parallelism, et cetera, or memory parallelism. And we also worry about memory management. Taking data from a disk 
or of the network to your main memory, from your main memory to last level cache to L2 to L1, into your register and back up the hierarchy again. If you spend all your time doing that, you find the processor's doing no work whatsoever and the memory hierarchy is doing all the work for you. So you want to make sure we don't do that. So compiler writers worry about that. And as we heard uh, yesterday and will continue to be the case, the performance gap between what we actually achieve and peak performance is getting worse and worse and worse. So we sport bending all that time in silicon, all that energy and CO2 into the atmosphere, being pumped and pumped, and what we're doing, we're wasting it. And maybe we as compiler writers can improve that. Maybe we can reduce the gap between there. And hopefully we'll have some ideas about that along the way. OK, so I, I, teach a, I used to teach a 20, 20 week, 20 lecture course on what a compiler is. I'm going to do it now in two slides, OK? So, this, so if you don't get all the details, there is a little bit more behind it. So let's try and get on with that. In a nutshell, a compiler is often thought as this kind of pipeline translation, translation process. It takes source, which could be, which is basically characters coming in from a keyboard or from a file, and eventually generates a bunch of characters at the other end, which is called assembler. But we interpret those characters as having meaning. If, and the front end really tries to extract that meaning. It looks at the characters, generates tokens or lexical units, and then puts them into a syntax tree, so it has some syntactic, syntactic or grammatical structure. Then it does some semantic analysis to understand what you mean by those things. Once it does that, it tries to do some optimization to that structure, and eventually it lowers it down again. So characters in, build meaning, all the way along, drop it down again to assembler. So there's a pipeline. And we tend to worry about whereabouts we work in the pipeline. So most of the front end is kind of already done back in the 50s. There's modular changes now. You don't see many papers on front end um, stuff, but occasionally there's bit of, the bits of it. And most of the work goes in this end. People in companies worry about the back end a lot. Clearly, you've got to get your assembler generated correctly. Um, most research happens in the restructuring or the middle end. That's where we like to play, because we can get some performance then. And we, worry, and we don't have to worry about the difficult bits either end. So in a nutshell, we take an expression like this, x minus 2 times y, and we represent it as an abstract syntax tree. So the tree says, multiply those two together, and then you want to take it away from that guy. Why do we use this? Well, it's not just this is a pretty way of representing algebra. It allows us to do code generation. So over here, I've stolen the example from Cooper's book, reference number 3. And he shows that using the syntax tree, you use a, a code generation, walk through the tree, you can generate code. And he's got this kind of idealized assembler here. So I'm not going to go into all the details, but this first two pair, load the address of x into a register, and load the offset with the stat pointer, add the two together, and stick into a register. Put it another way, load x, the value of x, into 1. So that's that register 1, that's that one done. Similarly, this is structured here, loads the value of um, 2 into register 2. This one here loads the value of y into register 3. So, you've got, so now we've got 1, 2, and 3. I've got the values of x, y, and 2. And then you do the multiplication here, and then you do the subtraction there. Da -dum. So that's a very, very quick way from source code to assembler in one slide. OK. So what we've done, we've got a way of representing programs and using a simple code generation technology. You can walk through it and get something out there. But as you can imagine, this is not the best way to do these things. Indeed, if you looked at this piece of code, you realize three registers have been used along the way. One, two, and three. So by the end of this code, you use three. Now, registers are a very valuable re uh, resource inside a compiler. If you use too many of them, you're going to have to spill memory up to cache or to main memory, and that's really expensive. And you want to avoid that. So maybe there's better ways to do it. But that's correct. <coughs> What we could, sorry, um, I'll try not to cough into my microphone. What we could also worry about is not just translation. I said at the beginning, it's also um, optimization. So what does optimization mean? Well, here's a very simple example. You've got two um, assignments here, A equals B times C plus D, equals 2 minus B times C. The very sharp amongst you will notice that B times C is being done twice. So what you could do is put that into a temporary, B times C, and you only do it the once. Is there any reason why that might be a bad idea? It looks like a good idea to me. You've saved yourself the multiplication. Why, why, why might it be a bad idea? Right. 
very cautious audience. Oh, very good. It could do, you could have an interrupt there. So say, for instance, uh, say some external nasty thing happened in a parallel thread and it updated that value. Yeah, that could happen. There's, a, there's, a, there's an easier answer than that. Well, that's a very sophisticated answer. Has anybody else got any, a, a guess at the easier answer? Yep. So I use an additional register for T? Exactly. You, you've traced it space for time. You save some time, but it's costing you some more space. You're using an extra reg, potentially an extra register for T. And actually, that can really kill you. I know one example, I was working on a back end of a GPU compiler, and actually register pressure was absolutely the key thing. So what they would do, they would try to avoid this updating, and they tried to do the exact inverse to reduce register pressure. This is what's known as rematerialization, to so actually try to create the values again. So in actual fact, although this is generally thought to be a good idea, there are many cases it's exactly the wrong idea. And this is a good example of where actually in compilers is whether I should do A or B, the answer is it depends. It depends on the context. Later on, we talked, um, so that's kind of what I call a middle end optimization, something that's kind of it platform independent. This one's more to do with code generation. Do you remember you looked at this example where we walked through our tree generating data? Well, actually, if we walked through the tree in a different way, so rather than one, two, three, four, five, if we walked in the other way here, generating this code, you see we use one less register along the way. Again, that could be critical in some examples. So just a very simple thing. Every single decision you make inside a compiler could have performance impact later on down the line. So you have to consider that as well. So, in a nutshell, we've done two slides on compilers, and that's it. If you go want to know more details, go read that red book, but in a sense, it's a pipeline that takes source in and generates assembly on the way out. Okay, so the question you have to say is, why do we need new techniques? Um, that seems to be working. We've been happy with this for quite a long time. Indeed, I've still, in the, like everybody else does, the Moore's Law diagram, but I've put some stuff on top. Back here, things are trundling along, no problem. In 2005, uh, we hit one of those, the power wall. We, you know, it was too much, it was taking too much energy out. Later on, 2000, 2010, 15, we simply hit Dinard scaling problems. You can't stick enough transistors on there anymore. But this, up to about then, basically through my lifetime, we've had 50 years of Moore's law. And I'd say, actually, although we haven't seen the exponential benefits as users, it's actually transformed the society we live in in a really fundamental way. It's actually enabled the, enabled the digital age. So everything we have, everybody here will have computers on them, inside their phones, they'll be in the building, everywhere. It's completely transformed our lives. And it's because of Moore's law. The fact is that we can write software today because we're guaranteed to know it's going to work tomorrow and it's going to work better tomorrow. It's going to be faster. And that's an important thing because if you know your software you put now, it's going to always going to work. You're willing to invest in it. If that's no longer the case, say things, things got slower and worse, you know, every 10 years, computers got slower. Why would you invest time in writing software now when it's going to go down? It's like living in an inflation versus a deflationary economy. If you no longer have growth in your economy, why would you invest in things now? That's the same for software. Why would you invest? And we've come into the end of that, that law, end of that um, era. Now, you could think of that as a bit of a scary thing, but I'm not trying to say you as compiler writers, it's really exciting because suddenly we're needed, and I'll come back to that in a minute. It's coming to an end, and the contract between us and the hardware is breaking down. What was that contract? The contract was, I give you an ISA, instruction set, set architecture, and it's never going to change. Underneath the hood, the hardware does all sorts of mad stuff. I mean, really mad stuff, but you don't worry about that. I'm going to hide it to you. And the compiler's job then was to take the source code and map it down to this ISA. That's changing now. We can't keep that contract anymore. Suddenly, ISA is no longer the same. It starts to get um, changed a little bit. And that means the contract's breaking. The software you write today may not work tomorrow because what the thing it's targeting may not be around tomorrow. What happens if x86 stopped tomorrow? Well, there's no ARMv8. Suddenly, all that software doesn't work anymore. And that's not quite what's going to happen, but the contract in hardware and software where we know what it looks like is going to change, and that puts everything in jeopardy. But, but, there's not, but jeopardy means opportunity. If we can develop software that can work with change, then maybe we've got a chance to influence the future. So, I think this comes as no surprise um, that technology trends means hardware is growing more specialized or heterogeneous. We heard yesterday's um, keynote, but all those abstraction layers going through the thing. If you have lots of abstraction layers, which makes things general, 
It's great, but it's actually inefficient. If you specialize your hardware and your software stack, so that it's for a particular application for a particular thing, you can get massive performance improvements. I think I saw some very ambitious paper saying, if you did it right, you could get up to 100,000 times performance improvement just by optimizing your architecture and stack. That was assuming really bad software and really bad hardware, but nevertheless, there's huge gains to be had. And everybody's noticed that. That's why we have specialized accelerators. Um, but the software can't fit on this new hardware. If I give you an NPU from a, I don't know, a Chinese manufacturer tomorrow and I say, run your software on it, nobody knows how to do that. It's very tricky. The actual underlying hardware is very, very complicated and it's not at all obvious how software can fit onto it. And this is potentially going to be a crisis. If your software can't fit on the new hardware, why would you build a new hardware? Because it can't be used. If you don't build a new software hardware, then we're going to have a decline in performance. So you have this kind of uh, deadlock or chicken and egg thing. And this is the reason why um, people are, are spending a lot of time trying to think of new hardware, new software, new APIs, new languages to get around this problem. Again, I'm not the first person to notice this entirely. Everybody knows this, but it actually fundamentally changes what our role as compiler people are, and that's the thing I'm interested in. Okay. Okay, so this, this is a really personal view of how I see the world at the moment, so please feel free to disagree. And, but it summarizes, I think, the challenge we have ahead. In the good old days, we used to have programs which we used to write in C, Fordrand, whatever, press the compiler button to x86, and our job was done. We could walk away. Very, it was a very steady world, or maybe there were one or two other items, but we could let, let it be, OK? And then, actually, on the other side, x86, they, all the microarchitecture, that was a hardware person's thing, OK? This is very steady, but it was pretty boring in some sense. This stays the same. What's the improvement that we can give? Very little. It's the same thing time and time again. x86 behavior may change, so maybe a sub is better than an ad next week. Maybe a mole is a better idea. But, you know, it's pretty small potatoes from a compiler point of view. And you say up to the 90s, um, we find out the compiler research was kind of in the doldrums. And I'm going to go back to that a little bit later on. On the other hand, the our hardware guys had fun. They could actually add more and more silicon, more and more things. They had more and more mad instructions. You used to have eight, eight issue wide superscalar machines with huge predictors here, there, and everywhere. So all the fun was on, the, on, the, on that side of the equation. But things are changing. Changing, um, and the world finds it a bit scary, but it's an opportunity for us. So I'll give an intermediate point. Let's think about OpenCL. OpenCL is um, being used for GP, GPUs. There's other types of um, interfaces. But they fundamentally changed the contract. The, the interface now is a language. There is no ISA exposed for the hardware. And from the hardware guy's point of view, that's exciting. They can change their ISA every single week if they wanted to, because you, the user, are, are freed from it. So it allows them to do lots of innovation. So raising the abstraction layer, increases the innovation opportunity for manufacturers. However, they have to do a bit more work now. They don't just do the microarchitecture, they do the architecture ISA, and they also do the JIT compiler, that side. So suddenly their jobs got a lot more complicated. So good in some sense that they can get more opportunities, but there's a lot more work they have to do. <clears throat> and on uh, tomorrow's lecture, I'll talk about some of the technology we, we can look at to help that mapping from high-level languages down to hardware. And then, who does this bit here? Well, wouldn't it be nice if it's just like the old days where you put your program in and the compiler does it? Does it work that way at the moment? No, we asked the programmer to do it, OK? So was, where's the compiler now? Well, it sits over here in this kind of murky space inside companies. Or, it's, uh, or and then we get programmers to do the work. So our role's kind of shrunk. But why can't the compiler do this thing? Why is it suddenly it can only do low-level stuff and it can't manage this? Why can it go from programs to x86 but not programs to OpenCL? So that's something we'll look at a little bit later on too. And if you look to common today, today, your languages are no longer just C or Fortran, they may be PyTorch. And the things you write in are not they don't they don't look at OpenCL or x86, they look at high-level libraries. Um, so you could, uh, such as BLAS libraries, or they could actually use DSL such as Halite, or they could use some other um, type of interfaces underneath. So this level now is that you take a high-level program and you map it down to some high-level interfaces. And that's great from a performance point of view, because you can guarantee that any vendor is going to make sure that runs really, really quick. So if your code uses BLAS routines, you're going to do really well. And hence, you see a lot of work in ML workloads, but how do you take ML and map it down to those libraries? 
The hardware vendors have got a bit of a hard time now. <laughs> They've got even more work to do, but even more opportunity. They need to take some compiler people on, some library people on. But who's doing this thing? If you've got a programmer who has to keep doing, doing this, he's not going to be very happy, or he or she's not going to be very happy. There's going to be constant change in the DSLs, constant change in the interfaces, and you're not going to invest in some software, say, Halide doesn't exist next week, or the Blas libraries change, or the interfaces change. Yesterday we said this is going to be a problem um, because nobody agrees on the APIs. Why well, I think, actually, fact, it's a challenge to us as a community. Constant change of our interest face for programs down to these languages means any solution we have to automate that process as compiler writers must work for any API and any DSL. So we need to be able to do walk, and this happens on both sides of the interface. So we need technology that works for any API down to hardware and for many user code up to interface. So I'd like to be exploring those ideas with you over the next four days about how we develop technology that can work whenever the interface changes. So you don't care what the API is, you don't care what the DSL is, you can manage it. And if we can answer that problem, then we can have innovation at the hardware level, innovation at the uh, programming language level, and we solve a lot of the problems for the future. Well, so that's an optimistic view of how things may turn out. So <clears throat> I'm going to give you a brief um, a rattle through about the concept of automation. So to do all the things I've just talked about, we're going to need to automate the process. We're going to be able to need to automate um, low level uh, user programs to interfaces, interfaces to hardware. We need to, be able to automate all that. And automation is actually at the core of what we do as compiler people. It's been there since the very beginning. So 1950s really was the heyday of our topic. It's all been a bit boring since, to be absolutely honest. They went from auto-programming, where you actually took your Fortran and automatically wrote your assembler for you, and, and assemblers automated the binary generation. So that's when it all took place. Early Fortran compilers did that work for you. They also did... Um, they went to auto optimization so in other words, compilers started to work out how to use your registers. So that's a really big thing. And the 60s and 70s were really a heyday for new languages and uh, 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 automatic tools such as Lex and Yak and stuff to make that pipeline faster. What we found is um, from 2005 onwards is the software gap started to appear. See, because now we had multi-cores and it doesn't matter how clever your hardware is, it can't make software parallel. It needs some uh, compiler support. So suddenly we were back in the game in 2005. 2010 onwards, we see all this rapidly changing hardware accelerators, so suddenly we're really, really important. So we've come from, a, the 1950s was a great time, 2005 onwards are getting more important, so what happens in the middle? Well, in the 1990s to the 2010s, well, actual fact, compilers decided to move away from their traditional role and start to say, hey, actually, there's some performance we're missing out there. Can we get some of that to um, extra performance? And then there's some work about analysing where the performance was getting lost, and this really led to the whole area of auto-tuning, iterative compilation, search-based technologies, and machine learning. And it was down to pure, um, um, poor compiler performance. And what I'm going to do in this sort of remaining set of these slides is talk about a rapid tour through what why they did what they did, and how, we, how, how those things affect what we do now. So I'm halfway, uh, half an hour in. Is there any questions at this point? Yeah. So uh, going back a slide. Uh, sure. When you were talking about the... Um, uh, this one. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, in, in terms of the constant change of the API, and you yeah. said you envisioned that there, there would be um, some solution that would work for all of them. Yes. Uh, is that in, does MLIR meet that um, vision, or does it only solve part of it? Like I think MLR, uh, it's very interesting, that question. MLR, for those who may not know about it, is an internal representation in the LMVM family, which allows you to have multiple intermediate representations, which potentially can merge lots of targets. So yes, but only half the answer. Say, for instance, you've got a 1,000 dialects of MLIR, so each of those does really well over here. Great. How do you get your original code to that MLR thing? And the answer to that is in lecture four where we actually look at lifting, where we actually do program synthesis. You stick your code in, and you take it up to the appropriate level of MIR. So the answer is yes, but we need new technologies. So say, for instance, you've got HLO, or, uh, which is a dialect in uh, MLIR, How, and, you, and you stick your code in, it goes into the LLVM SSA form. How would you get it from SSA to HLO? Hope. That's not really going to work. You need some technology to do that, and that technology is um, lifting technology. And there's some work by Tobias Grosser, who did a multi-level tactics, looks at how you do that type of thing. We're investigating that actively right at the moment. So that's a great question. I know I didn't plant him in the audience. <laughs> Any, yes? Just sort of add on to that question. So, but do you think adding these, like 
other MLIR, which for patients sort of adds these layers of abstraction, which you can establish based on what it is. So, I, so this, I fundamentally disagree with this levels of abstraction make inefficient. I think levels of abstraction, which we all have to agree upon, does make it inefficient. But you have a thousand levels of abstraction, but you only pick one to your hardware, then it's not going to have that problem. If I can take your program, you say call smart interface, and smart interface is very, very clever. It can go whatever way it likes to the hardware. You, you the programmer, don't care. My point is, if you make the interface as high as possible, you can get rid of all that stuff underneath, and this can change all the time, because there is no interfaces anymore. And my point further would be, if we have a technology that allows you to have any interface at that level, we'll just, we'll just buy the fastest one tomorrow. If, if for instance, CL Blast 2 is faster, we'll just throw it away, use the fast one. So it actually, it actually enables an ecosystem which allows performance to take place. Yeah. So 1990s to 2010 was, this, was really a time where there was a case for evidence-based approaches. We looked at, rather than going from compilers just doing rules and trying to do mini optimizations to say, is there any evidence that what we're doing is the right thing? It may seem strange, but we had maybe 40 years of us doing stuff with nobody evaluating what we were doing was correct. It sounds bizarre now, but that was certainly the case back then. So I'm going to take on a little example here called tiling and unrolling. And for some of you who may be a bit young, this language is called Fortran. It's still being used in the high performance world. And this do i equals 1 to 100 is like a for loop, 1 to 100. I'm sure you don't need to be told that, but just in case there's some um, out of town people who don't know about Fortran, here it is. OK, so the question is, tiling and rolling has been studied for God knows how many years about that stage. And there's loads and loads and loads of papers about it. And the question is, what's the right tiling and roll factor for a piece of code? And what people would do is say, hey, I take in Dave's example, and I'm better than Dave. And then Brian would come along and say, I'm better than, I'm better than Dave, and I'm better than Charles. So they'd always compare themselves to each other, OK? But nobody compared themselves to the optimum answer. We didn't even answer that question, because nobody knew what that would be. So let's look at um, tiling and unrolling. So in the roller piece of code, you've got, it goes 1 to 100 here. This unrolls by a factor of 3. So that means you replicate the inner loop three times. This three here means you step through, so you go one, four, seven, ten. Oh, that's about it. And there's an actual fact because three doesn't go to 100 well, it only goes up to 99, you get this last iterator here. So you have this epilogue loop. And this type of thing is a very well known transformation. Um, uh, and actually, it reduces the number of branches in your loop. You unroll to reduce stuff. And it's well known in compilers. Um, in fact, most low level compilers would do this automatically now. But nevertheless, um, if you unroll your high level code and you, there's a low level unroll uh, inside the compiler, they actually interact in kind of weird ways. We'll look at it a little bit later. So that's a transformation, good for basically instruction level parallelism. The other one was um, tiling, which is good for memory layouts. The idea if you want to look at a big piece of data, you, you can't fit it all in your small cache. You break it into nice little chunks. So big data, small chunks, each of these small chunks were fit inside your cache. You bring it in, you do the work on it, and you pop it out again. And there's a gazillion papers on tiling, and there'll probably be a gazillion more. So how does tiling work as a transformation? You take your loop here, double nested loop, and if you, what you do, you tile, say, the inner loop. What does that mean? You strip mine, J, which you break it up into, into strips of size S, J, strips of size S, and then you have another loop that goes over the little iterators inside it. So say n was um, 16 and s was 4, the outer loop would go 1, 5, 9, uh, up to 16. Up to, uh, no, uh, um, not up to 16. The inner loop would go from 1 to, to, go from 1 to 4, 5 to 8, etc., etc. OK? So there's a way of actually just partitioning the iteration space up into strips. And if you do that for both iterators and then interchange them, you get a tiled thing. OK, that's a very, very short introduction to tiling. There are, I said, a gazillion papers on that. The idea is you're breaking up data so that you reuse your memory cleverly. So the question is, what's the right number? So this question uh, we, uh, was looked back by the Atlas compiler people. These are the, um, this came out of um, uh, trying to tune Blas libraries. And also Francois Baudin looked at this problem back, back in the um, 90s. And what he did, <coughs> he actually went through all unroll factors and all tile sizes and plotted them. And this is the space you get. It's, opt it's an optimization space. And actually, in fact, you see it's massively nonlinear. It's got lots of, it's got lots of um, troughs. It's got 
really bad peaks around the outside, and somewhere in there is the minimum. Where is the minimum? That's the question. Where's Wally? Where is it in there? And does it change across programs? Does it change across hardware? The question is yes, and the question is also, does existing analytical approaches work? And the answer to that one is no. Because all you have to do is slightly change your hardware and, you, and the analytical solution will be wrong. So what he did there was he tried to take slices through that data to see what it looked like. And I'm going to show you some of those slices in a second. So um, these are old machines now. His historical interest, it is, remember, the 90s, 2010s. So he took a slicer and looked at an old UltraSpark machine there and found out the minimum performance, from our point of view, was a small unroll factor, which is a, not that surprising. But 57 was the right tile size. Can I just say, there was no paper in existence at that time that said tile size 57 was the right answer. No, despite the fact we had hundreds of them, nobody had bothered evaluating it. They all thought something else was a good one. And um, if you get it, the difference between getting it right and wrong is a factor of 10. So it was an important thing to get right, but nobody bothered checking what they had was right. Okay. Um, and the actual fact, if you look at the, the amount of space that's near the minimum, it's 2.6. So you had a one in 50 chance of getting it right. An alpha, um, a more aggressive machine at the time, actually had, again, a similar unroll factor around four, but tile size is now 85. Again, nobody would have ever predicted that. Only a very tiny part of the space is near the minimum. It's like a, what they call a, a golf green optimization space, the tiny hole of good spots, lots of flat and nothing. And again, 10 times difference in the original and the best code. Furthermore, if you got it wrong on the alpha, you're going to be three times slower. So getting it wrong is really bad. Getting it, getting it right is really hard, but if you get it right, you get ten times. Again, no analysis would tell you that. So we get this picture of um, small unrolls um, and weird tile sizes is the right answer. But in actual fact, you went to other spaces here, you actually find a really completely different story here. Actually, large unroll factors and tiny tile sizes is a good one. Um, here, it's a lot flatter space on, the, on the, this machine. 7% of, of the space is near the minimum. There's only two times difference. But then if you look at the most popular machine at the time, it was an Intel machine, it's entirely different again, where you wanted large unroll sizes, and again, that tile size of 57. The message here is not the history lesson we're going through, but the thing was is that despite hundreds of papers on this, no prior scheme had predicted what the right answer was. And furthermore, as compiler writers, we just weren't interested. So we've seen a change from theory-based view of the world, so let's look at some evidence-based view of the world. That's what is the evidence that we're doing the right thing, and that's been a fundamental change we've seen started back then. So, it's, this is my kind of summary. Why, why were compilers' uh, heuristics failing? Well, we've look, been looking at this problem for about 50 years, so why aren't we getting the right answer? And the real reason is over here, my very nice block diagram. Okay? This is a compiler's writer's view of the world. It's a nice model, you know, cache, instruction, memory, da da. The reality is this thing here, over here, it's like a, a, a mess. There's device drivers in there, there's interrupts, there's unspecified architectural things they haven't told you about with some special bits inside the machine. There's random replacements versus pseudo random replacement. All these different things, the machine is much more complicated. You have all those levels of translation software as well. You have the underneath you, there's an assembler, there's actually a post code generation, there's a linker. There's all these things. There's some random placement. There's TLB misses going on the side. All those things we just don't worry about because we don't like to see them. But that's, fact, that's what the real world is. So as long as we keep looking at the world as blocks like that, we can generate code, which, we, which is better than our friends, but in actual fact it's nowhere near the optimum because we're missing the reality over there. And the reason we're doing badly is not because we're you know, evil people who are stupid. Well, maybe some of us are, but not all of us. The reason is actually fundamentally picking the right code is undecidable. You can't even tell if a program is ever going to terminate. You know, according to our, so if you can't tell if a program is going to terminate, how can you show it's going to be faster to not terminate? It's tricky. So it's an undecidable problem, generally. And we've got this hardware underneath it. It's very, very complicated, and not all of it's been revealed to us. Also, the program behavior will depend on the data which you don't see access to. So different control paths of the program, different bits and pieces will be shown. So in other words, it's a very complicated problem. So we could say, yeah, okay, it's too hard, we did our best. The fundamentally processor architecture behavior is very complex and ever-changing. 
And particularly if you look at new devices where we don't even know what the architecture is because it's hidden behind OpenCL interface. Out of order behavior and cache have non-deterministic behavior on your code. So if it's non-deterministic, uh, complicated, and, uh, and you've got an undecidable problem, no wonder we don't do too well. But here's the thing, programmers somehow are able to get better performance. So here's a big meta message for the day. What we do as compiler writers is what tomorrow is what programmers do today. We just automate what they do. So why don't we look at what they do and try to copy that? Okay? And that's really probably what I've been doing for 30 years, is talk to programmers and try and steal their jobs, try to automate them. And as you see by the last lecture, I'm trying to automate myself now and steal my job. But I'll be retired by then, so I don't mind. Okay, here's, the, here's this picture. The case for automa automation. Automation space is hard, especially if the hardware changes, and it changes regularly. If you want to have an uh, optimization uh, approach that works on all future hardware across all programs, this is a tricky problem. We saw that kind of valleys and cliffs type thing earlier. The point I want to point on again is all compiler analysis fails. So that's a pretty damning indictment, right? It failed. Um, and, and it failed on a benchmark that was the most studied one out there. So I'm sure it wasn't doing too well on all the other stuff. Um, so what we saw was a kind of cultural shift in our community, away from an evidence a theory based thing which says I model this following, I make this model up, it's lovely because I can solve it with instant linear algebra and I've got a really cool um, uh, SAT solver to do that, to actually let's try each of those answers you've come out and see what it's like on the real hardware and see what the space really looks like. So we, and what we saw was really two ways forward from this view. One was a search-based technique, sometimes called auto-tuning, particularly we talk about program algorithms, iterative compilation if you're a compiler person, but they're the same thing really. And then also trying to automate the automation. Can we automate searching? So rather than searching across a program every time you want to do it, can't you remember what you did last time and do it again? And that's what we've been looking at now. And really, this thing here is a thread I'm going to be picking up throughout the um, uh, lecture course, how we automate things using machine learning. And we're going to be today talking about kind of machine learning 1.0, old school machine learning. And then we'll be talking more, more modern stuff a little bit later. OK. Any questions before I get into some, some reminiscing about some papers? No. OK, good. No, not, good, you're not disagreeing too much so far. OK, so the early work was really looking at um, profile-directed compilation was quite popular. So what that did, you run the program a couple of times, see what its performance, uh, and what you did, you try to work out its control flow favor, and then you use that to actually improve the code. So it was very successful in things such as VLIW scheduling, the Bulldog compiler, or way back when, used this type of technology. So you could work out how to lay out basic blocks and reduce your branches, etc., and allowed you to get quite full VLIW um, instructions. So it's quite popular. Um, but its performance gains are really modest, if you don't think about it. It just focuses on persistent control flow, and all other information is ignored, thrown out. So the auto-tuning or iterative compilation world said, hey, hang on, rather than just doing once and getting a profile out, why don't we do it again and again and again and again and again, and then learn about what's going on as we go through it. So we can search the space, not just for control flow behavior information, for actual hard performance. So one of the first people to do this um, was uh, Keith Cooper at uh, Rice University. And what he did, he had this kind of idea of breaking that old compiler picture we said at the beginning and making the middle bit of the compiler a bit flexible so you can swap stuff around. So rather than doing A followed by B followed by C as your kind of phase, uh, phase passes, what you're going to do is something a bit clever. You can try different versions of it and you're going to steer it. So what you do, you, you have A, B, C, run the code, see what it does. CBA, run the code, see what it does. And you keep playing around with them, searching that space until you find the best one. And he found, using that technology, he gave up to 25% over the default. However, here's some caveats. Now I can tell you where all the skeletons are in these papers after they've been published. He only focused on code size. Why did he worry about code size? Because actually there's so much noise in these small benchmarks, you couldn't actually tell if one program was better than another. 
And whenever you see a paper that starts using simulators for actually getting accurate execution times, your alarm bell should be going off. The reason is the signal to noise is such that you, they actually don't care about the answer. Okay? That's why it's focused on code size and they actually use simulators around everywhere and gave some lame uh, uh, idea for it. Nevertheless, this was a very important paper at the time and it transformed the way we th see things. Uh, my colleague um, Hugh Leather looked at ways of um, getting around that noise problem, um, but still, if you've got too much noise relative to your signal, it's a way of nature telling you you've got the wrong problem to solve. More problematically, he looked at lots of um, algorithms, GAs, hill climbing, gradients, descents, and you know our community loved that. Oh, I could take this data, I can run my new algorithm, maybe have thousands of small algorithms, getting tiny, tiny improvements over the other guy. Um, but there was, we were lacking a systematic evaluation. Um, what was the space like? What should we do? In other words, why don't we just try random? What's the space look like? What does a random search like when we compare it to these other technologies? Nevertheless, this was the start of new algorithms to search optimization spaces, and it still goes on today. In actual fact, I reviewed a paper for a well-known conference just last week trying to have yet another algorithm just like this. I don't think it's going to do too well. Okay, so Akokov uh, in 2006 actually said, well, okay, why don't we let's see if we've got any, how does random work on this space? And he found out it worked as good as any. So here we go. Um, we've got a space of one, two, three, four, five compiler optimizations, and each of them has up to, I think, 10 options. So it's a space of size 10 to the 10. And he enumerated all of those 10 to the 10 on a TI and AMD machine. Took a lot of time. Um, and then worked out um, where the optimum was, and it's at 1.32 in there. And that's, I think it's the benchmark's ADCPM, for those who are very interested in that. And actually, if I want to see how long would it take to get to the optimum using just random evaluation, and here we are there, versus the best at the time, which is genetic algorithms. And as you see, the algorithm doesn't make much difference. Random gets there as good as any. So that's another warning. If you see paper claim to have great search technology, whatever, you should take the baseline um, search approach. What does the distribution look like? What does random sampling do? If they um, refuse to do that, then there's a question in your mind. Indeed, I actually uh, um, did an experiment with another paper which claimed to have this great algorithm. Random beats it within two goes. So um, you have to be a bit skeptical. If you look at other benchmarks, or uh, sorry, other settings such as GCC, you can have massive spaces there, and that's maybe so huge, bigger than the number of atoms in the known universe. Wow, how do you have to solve that problem? Well, actually, large parts of the optimization space for GCC are irrelevant. You can just get rid of them. So a bit of intuition gets rid of lots of noise. So to, to work well, what we found out was you need to have useful optimization spaces where there's no repetition, unlike GCC, and you need to find good points quickly. You can't afford to go through 10 to the... 260 points. And, and really this gets us to um, it's kind of the state of the art today. There's been many, many, many papers on searching, auto-tuning, etc. And really the state of the art really is open tuner from MIT. So what they did out there, rather than saying anyone's the right idea, they just gave you everything. So every possible algorithm out there is available. And it's a great bit of software. You can play Mario Kart games really well. You can also tune compiler systems really well. And it's been used for a, a bunch of other technologies, including the scheduling uh, languages for um, uh, Halide. And its key idea or innovation is that it allows ensemble type learning, which is rather than any one technique being a good idea, it just tries out a bunch of them. So the exploration explore, explores these guys here. I got this slide the wrong way around. So try this one for a bit, try this one for a bit, try this one for a bit. Keep going round and round. Eventually you'll see one of them starts to do better than the other, and then you can see effort into one of them, exploitation. If you want to call that a fancy thing, it's often called Bayesian optimization, where you get a sample of the space, you get to see how it's structured, and then you can exploit. So you explore to get a feeling of where you are, and then you focus. So here we have an exploration thing, and you can focus. And, if, and if online learning technologies sometimes do go backwards and forwards to this. So they do a bit of exploration, then exploitation, and backwards and forwards again. So because things may change, you may have got your answer wrong. So this is the state of the art, and it's, um, it's a very, very useful tool. If you're interested in using this technology for your, for your projects, I recommend you start with this, these pieces of work. So finishing this uh, topic up, um, there's 
over the years, there's been a, a bit of a disagreement. Uh, Keith Kubis' work said originally that um, the space was very, very flat. It's easy to find the optimums. Uh, Vudok can uh, actually show exactly the opposite. It's highly dependent on hardware. It's highly dependent on your program. I think the truth is somewhere bet in between the two. There are cases when you're looking at code size and stuff where things are relatively easy. When you want highly tuned performance on, say, neural processors, the space is very, very um, uh, non-linear. It's hard to get the right optimum. So depending on your target, you want to use different types of algorithms. Um, big problem, though, application tuning is not portable. If you're spending four days to tune a program that runs for 10 seconds, you spend a lot of time doing that. And it only makes sense if you're in situations such as embedded systems where that piece of code is going to stay inside your phone for a very long time. So you, you're worth having, it's worth paying the cost. Or maybe in um, uh, HPC when you're going to be running a weather model for a very long time, so it's a really good idea. But in general computing, when you download an app off the, off the net to run it on your phone, you're not going to spend four days to get a 10 second program a little bit faster. There, there are people who have done kind of um, work where you actually when you leave your phone at night time, unbeknownst to you, code gets low down, they do some experiments on top, and then they crowdsource it later on and pop it up tomorrow. But, uh, but you have to sign in for that, usually. Um, so the excessive compile time is not only useful for embedded systems or libraries. So your BLAS routines or the Atlas project, that made sense. And the key question is, rather than doing this search endlessly, why not just remember? Why not just remember what you did last time? Could you use stuff you did yesterday to help you do tomorrow? And that was really the move from, from the search-based technology into machine learning technology, which we're going to look at in more detail now. So, the remainder part of this lecture is going to be looking at machine learning for, for compilers. So, um, this is about the new technology we've got that allows you to try and remember knowledge about what you've done before to help you do better in the future. So I did compilers in two lectures, two slides. I'm now going to do machine learning for compilers in one slide. Okay? So if you remember anything, this is the one to attend to. Right. ML for compilers is really curve fitting. Okay? Or even straight line fitting. So say, for instance, you've got... There's two types of problem you need to worry about, classification and regression. Let's try classification. Say so I characterise my program by two things. Number of lines of code... Um, name of the programmer, okay? We, and then we want to know, is, uh, is it fast or is it slow? Well, we put name of programmer up there, lines of code, run them all, and we fit a line. So that when we get a new program, we say, hey, is it going to be an O or an X? So what would you say for this guy, O or X? 50-50 question, come on. O or X? O. Correct. Other guy, hint, it's not the first one. X, correct. So that's a classification. That's classification for you. You remember what you did last time and do it again. Okay? <clears throat> now, of course, there's very, ways, very clever ways to describe that line. Actually, I think support, support vector machines are one of those n-dimensional space, but it's the same thing. Sometimes you want to take a bit more complicated. Um, you've got inputs along here and you've got outputs along here. So really, in this particular case, this is a regression thing. We've heard of linear regression. So you just plot your dots along there and you say, OK, and plot the outputs and you fit a curve to it. The structure of that curve depends on the space. You put linear curves, you can put um, uh, splines, you can do all sorts of clever stuff. Chebyshev, Chebyshev polynomials, if you really want to do this sort of thing. And the question is, if I get a new input here, what's the probable output? Well, it's not hard. You go up to the line and you draw it across. Okay, so given a bunch of dots, you draw a line amongst them and you can predict. And that's what we do in compilers for machine learning. Put program characteristics along here, lengths to lines of code. And you want to know how long is it going to take to run. So I'm here, or oh, I'll go up there, it's going to take that long. Okay. Now, the smart amongst you will realize actually lines of code is not necessarily a good correlation with the execution time, and that's where knowing the right program characteristics or features is going to be a really crucial issue. We'll talk about it today, we're going to talk about it on Wednesday, and we're going to again talk about it on Friday. These things here is really the, the nub of the problem. But you also hear a lot of tech people talking about models for um, uh, you know, machine learning. Shall I use a deep neural network? Shall I use linear regression? Shall I use logistic regression? Shall I use SVMs? In actual fact, it's all about what type of curve do you fit? And the, sort of the big message I'd like to put across is actually it's not about the curve, it's about the dots. 
If you haven't got good dots, you can't fit good curves. It's about the data. So we tend to write our papers about um, machine learning. We always talk about the clever algebra, loss function, blah, blah, blah. It's actually about the quality of the data. If you put rubbish data into your model, you can get rubbish answers out. And I can, uh, every single paper you want on this area, you can, that's the weak spot. It's not the modeling. And often, rather than for execution time, we want to do the following. If I give you some program characteristics, can you predict the best transformation or optimization for it? So that's often the question we want to do. OK, so here we are. So this is the, um, the question we want to ask. Is, this is what machine learning looks like in one slide again. In our, but this time, this is how you build it, rather than how you look at it as a data modeling thing. You take some training programs, you do lots of experiments on them to you burn to your uh, CO2 thing, and you find the best configuration for a task, I, what flag to put on. Then you get your new program, so you get each of those programs, sorry, you get some features out of them, length of lines of code, number of, I don't know, ads, something like that, and you stick it into a machine learning algorithm, it does a correlation, it correlates number of ads against best configuration, and that is machine learning, that's the curve. Stick that curve into here, you get a new program you haven't seen before, and then you predict their answer. And that's exactly what machine learning technology does. So you're learning a model that correlates outputs to inputs. Whoops. Again, outputs to inputs, as we have over there. Um, the important point I like to get here, you have a distinct training and test data thing. Can I just say, Anybody who doesn't use machine learning but uses um, an analytical models in their papers, what they really do is they play around with analytical techniques on their experimental uh, setup until it works and then pretend it just came from nowhere and apply it to the, real, to the training data or the test data. Okay? Machine learning means you have to separate them. Non-machine learning techniques typically cheat. Okay? Maybe there's a paper out there that didn't cheat. I'll be surprised about that. Okay. What you did, you found a technique, you kept trying it until it worked, and you say, pretend it's a great idea. Machine learning means you have to separate your training and testing as a, as a more rigorous way of doing things. Okay, I'm going to share a few slides now about um, uh, some techniques that have been used. I'm going to start with the very earliest one, came from a guy I know very well, John Cavazos. His name will appear several times uh, um, in this uh, series. John was actually here in 2006, way back when we were younger people, and we had a great time. Okay, um, so what this is, the very first paper in the area, I was trying to learn how to schedule instructions. Uh, it appeared in NIPS in 1997. So this is a machine learning paper that was before the earlier search-based technology and compilers, before even the algorithmic searching. But, so this really pioneering paper didn't really get taken up by the community to much later. And the reason is we weren't looking at those problems back then. Two years later, this was hot stuff. So his question was, I'm going to look at instruction scheduling. So you've got a bunch of instructions. And I could choose one or two things to schedule next inside the processor. Which one should I pick? So here we go. It says you've got one, two, three, and four. Uh, instruction two is scheduled now. It's already going to be about to run next. Which one should I um, schedule next? I can't schedule instruction three next, but I can instru in schedule instruction one and four. Which one should I pick? Now, typically inside a compiler, there's some heuristic that tells you to do that. He tried to learn the heuristic that does, tells us to do that. So given a partial schedule two, what's the next instruction one or four? Um, so what he did, he, he trained um, this problem on many basic blocks and looked at all possible schedules. So in other words, he exhaustively tried everything and then worked out what the best ones were. And he recorded the, what were the best ones were. So if I, so pity the notation is pretty hard to understand, but if I is the best one, to go earlier, you record it as being the best one to go earlier, and you put a true as the output. So instruction I is the best one, and the other way around, J first is bad. So you just try all possible schedules. If, if one's better than two, record one, two as being true, and record two, one as being false. And you just scored lots of data. And machine learning is just remembering what you did last time. So you build a model that's got all that data in it, and then when you get a new program, you say, what did I do last, last time when I had a program that looked kind of like this one? So I'll see what that means in the next slide. So first you had to do is characterize what a schedule looks like. This is this thing about features. We're going to come back to this time and time again. So here you have the features here uh, with the tuple 214. What does that say? Two is the, the partial schedule, thing you've already scheduled. 
and he's saying one and four. Uh, if one goes first, I hope that was the best one in this time, so we record a true, but in four first is a, a bad idea, we record a false. And then we record what's known as the features of this problem. So the features are these things here. Can I, and these are kind of strange ones. So let me look at the odd, can I, is an odd or an even length schedule? Well, only one thing's been scheduled at the moment, so it's an odd schedule. Blah, blah, blah. The important one that differentiates these two guys is this one here. The critical path on instruction one it's got another instruction available, instruction three. So it's got a critical path of size one. Instruction four does no, no instructions depend on it. It's got a critical path of zero. That's the only difference in these two things. And then he'd go and execute them all, and he'd record what was good. So in other words, if you look at this example here, you go look in your database, and you say, actually, fact, in 15 occasions, put in, in one first was a good idea, and eight was a bad idea. In just three occasions, true, uh, was it a good idea to put four first and one second? OK? So what you do, you pick the first choice. So here we go. That's machine learning is rawest. You just remember what you did last time. And the key issue is say, hey, what, do I, what did I have last time that looks similar to now? You go in there for that particular schedule 214. You look at the odd EC, da, da, look at 15 and 18 and make a decision. So that's it. 15 is greater than 8, so let's do that one. Let's pick that choice. Before I move on to the slightly more complicated examples, does anybody got any questions about this particular um, model or how, it was, how, how it's used? Make sense? Not make sense? I'm at that stage now, we're past an hour, people are starting to fade a bit, so I'll, I don't know whether it's obvious or unintelligible, but I'll just keep on going. Yep, you have a question. How, how are the features are chosen? Are they chosen all ah, good question, very good question. I think you've even done that on the next slide. Yeah, yeah, you're doing well. Um, actually, in fact, they cheated, basically. They picked those features that were likely to be very good to do it. And this idea about how you pick features is the core issue when it comes to our machine learning. And the early papers kind of said, yeah, yeah, it's pretty obvious, but in actual fact, if they, for instance, have a thing whether you can do, is that an odd or not, or can it dual issue with the previous instruction? Why? Because the particular hardware they had had a dual issue, you could put two at a time, and that was critical for making decisions. So those features they picked, they knew by looking at the data ahead of time. So whilst I said they kept their training and their test data separate, they looked at the results to see what features would help you separate them. So yeah, of course. Different, it's a higher level of cheating in some sense. Yeah, so actually, how to get your features is the critical issue, and we'll talk about that as, as the lectures go on. Uh, well, it's still a critical issue. I mean, there's a lot of papers like before, but are they still doing a lot? Well, I, I, I'll jump to the end. What we do now, we use neural networks to pick the features. So deep neural networks effectively do an embedding of your program representation to something meaningful. You can train its learning embedding or representation that's maximally predictive across tasks. So in other words, we use learning to pick the actual right features now. So yes. So it was critical, but I think that's kind of solved now. Okay. Okay, right. Um, it didn't really take off. The reason was, actually, in my opinion, there was little headroom. They got only got, they got 98% of, of something that already took place. Who cares about 98% of something you've already got? You're saying better than what we've got. So here's the real issue. Don't pick problems where there's not room for improvement. This is the really big thing about research. If the current state of the art is there, Optimum is there, leave it alone. Do another problem. If you're there and there, it's worth putting some time into that. So if you're a PhD student, only spend time when there's room for improvement. And if you don't know there's room for improvement, but you think it's a good idea, alarm bell should go off in your head. Don't do that topic. Prove to yourself there's room for improvement. I, for instance, I have many students, before they even implement anything, I get them to do it all by hand to prove that it beats the current technique. Now, one very famous guy now, a professor at a prestigious university, he spent six months actually demonstrating that he shouldn't bother doing a topic. But better he spent six months abandoning a topic than the entire PhD on it. Anyway, I digress. OK, um, time is slipping by, and I've been told to finish qu a quarter past. Um, I'm just going to rattle through a few other examples. Monster Frot, again from Bodan's group, he actually wants to learn how to unroll. And again, he picked, these, um, he picked these features to decide, and he built a model, and it worked. Again, back to our previous technique, those, those features are ones he thought would be pretty important for unrolling. Um, how many operations you have, only how many iterations you have in the loop. If you don't have any many iterations, it's not worth your while. And then he built a classifier. This is a classical thing called a DS decision tree, and you can work out whether to do it. So if you're in your region A, unroll the loop. If you're in your region B, don't unroll the loop. Um, it's pretty straightforward. 
However, it assumes that the optimization space is convex. What happens if you've got like a region of Bs in there? That model won't allow you to do that. So models sometimes restrict what you can describe. Sometimes they're powerful. But if you've got non-linear, non-convex spaces, you want to use a different model. But different models require more data, so it's always a trade-off. Um, what did he find out? He was 85% accurate, and he actually got some improvement over GGS 77. So that was an improvement. Unlike uh, Kavazos, he could actually do better than the state of the art. But it's pretty modest, and 4%, as any of you know, is actually in the noise range. So did you really get 4%? Um, and G77 is a really easy compiler to beat. And it only works on a few numbers of benchmarks. Um, he also, in this piece of work, only looked like, shall I enroll or not? Uh, Leather, again, did some more work on that, and he actually predicted the unrolling factor. And it made a big difference. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time on this one, then I'll, I'll, I'll probably get to the end. So can we use machine learning to focus our iterative compilation search? So the key idea in this piece of work from uh, Agrikov was, if I got a new program, can I use prior knowledge of previous programs to do the right thing? So if I found for program E, the minimum was in this part of the space, program A was there and there, if I have this new program, can I just look at what it looks like? Does it look a little bit by E? If it looks like E, I'll pick the optimal hit god. If it doesn't look like E, it looks like D, I'll pick the best one of that. So look up what does it look like. And then when you know which program it looks like, can you use the distribution of its optimization space to search? And how do you summarize that space? Well, the next slide looks a bit scary, but it's a, a way of trying to describe that. So this bit here describes what the space looks like as a summary. Like a lot of people like to use a lot of maths to confuse. It's really simple, say, the probability of two transformations being a good idea is the probability of one of them being a good idea times the probability of another. So if S1's got a probability of 8, 0.8, and uh, S2's got a probability of 0.1, then the answer is 0.08. That's it. Okay, so you can use this model to tell you how likely is a transformation going to be good. And then if you look like, so in other words, you can just scroll through all those transformations and find the one with the maximum value and pick that. There's a slightly more complicated model there. Um, a point about features was, look at the features they used. Wow. And we've only got five programs in this benchmark suite set. So they clearly overfed, <laughs> overfitted the data here. They compressed it and I joined um, very well and we ended up um, tuning the feature space to give us the right answer. You shouldn't be doing that, really. Anyway, it worked, and if you looked at the performance, random search gave you just 32%. Using this smart searching technology, you can boost it. So here you have an example where machine learning can boost search together. Um, I'm not going to go on. This is uh, taxonomy. Um, this is probably the, the key point I get before we finish very quickly. Um, features are critical to success. Um, how you automatically generate them it was tricky. Uh, Hugh Leather and his PhD looked at techniques to go through using genetic programming as a way of doing it. Uh, now that looks a bit, um, a bit odd nowadays. And what we use is really um, techniques such as embedding, which we'll look at in lecture three. Um, model selection, people love to play with models. Actually, in fact, it's less important than the data. We don't really care about the model. It's the data that matters. Um, and the other thing I want to say to you is, please pick the right application. I don't want to see any more papers on flag selection in GCC, right? We don't want that anymore. The maximum performance improvement you get is 5%. We live in a world of multi-cores and accelerators. There's much more exciting problems out there than GCC flags, so please don't do that. Um, parallelization, how do you parallelize for massive machines? So that's a real pr big problem. Um, so we look at some, I'll give you one final example. Uh, this was um, from uh, George at our place. We want to look at parallelization. If you look at our CC comp compiler, it gets um, across the spec and, and as benchmarks, it gets a speed of 0.9x. So that's a slowdown. So our state of the art compiler at the time, at the time, so there's an interim representative here, didn't actually get a slowdown. However, if you did it manually, you get a speed up. So how could you, what's the reason for that? Well, the reason for the poor performance is that there's static analysis can't find the fact that this is a parallel loop because of the rain direction. Profiling shows it's parallel, but analysis doesn't. So conservative compiler people are stopping us from getting the performance we need. So can we combine profiling to tell us it's probably parallel with machine learning to exploit it? The answer is yes. So profiling and machine learning, there's a restriction on static analysis. Use some profiling. So you, you take your code in, you do some profiling to find probably parallel, 
and then use machine learning to actually predict which of those parallel loops you should execute. Of course, you could be wrong, but you can use transactional memory, speculation, rollbacks to get around it. And in fact, if you keep doing it enough times, you can be 99.999% sure it's going to be fine. And in fact, it's exactly what programmers do, don't they? How do I know if my program's parallel? I profile it. So we're just copying them again. And doing that, we were able to show that while ICC was very good at getting lots of loops, only found the loops you shouldn't bother worrying about, like the initialization loops, the tiny loops. The big ones that really matter, it was skipping. So by using this technology where you actually predict, you find all the parallel ones and then use machine learning to predict the right ones, you finally get 96% of the hand parallelized technique. So by using two technologies, profile directed compilation, which you saw back in the early 90s, and more modern machine learning, which is now uh, more recent, combine the two together and you can get good performance that outperforms the state of the art. Um, and it's been also been done for GPUs as well, and I won't bother with this. So, I rattled through that last bit a little bit. Sorry for that, maybe the, um, slightly just, um, disturbed by the uh, microphone. I want to say we've talked today about what a compiler is in two slides, what machine learning is in one, but really what I've talked about is really old school ML for compilers, so the past really. Um, there's been hundreds of papers on this since 1997, and there's been too many on flag selection, I've probably said that before. <laughs> uh, but there, and there's a lot of interest in the modeling rather than the data. The data is the stuff that really matters. It's excellent for profitability heuristics. Is it a good idea to try this or not? But it's not involved for anything involving correctness, because it's a bit scary to use it for rewriting your, your avionic code. The key issue of transfer is often missed. If I develop a model for my system here, can I use it for another system over there? We don't look at that so often. But since 2010, this feature, the interest in auto-feature selection has been really coming forward, rather than hand-coded techniques. And we're looking at um, beyond classification of regression to really generative techniques. So in other words, how can we actually generate programs rather than decide yes or no on them? And I think that's the end of this lecture. Um, so this is the easy one. This is going to get a little bit more complicated next. And then Wednesday is going to be you know, a bit steep uphill. Um, so um, get some sleep that night. Thank you.